Hi, everyone. It's Sue. And as promised, I'm going to wrap up where we left off with pain. And I sure wish I was there with you because it's so exciting to talk about all this, but also really um, important to communicate how devastating pain can be, both how devastating acute experience of pain can be and how devastating chronic uh, pain can be for the lives of people experiencing it. So I've backed up, we had gone just a slider to be on this, but I've backed it up to this point where we're starting at a logical point and remembering that we've talked about other kinds of interventions for pain. We certainly have talked about the various components of pain, the types of pain, how we respond to it, the dimensions of pain. Remember, it's not just physiological, there's uh, you know, psychological, all those other dimensions of pain um, and that uh, nociception, all of that. We've, we've really gone through the um, pathophysiology uh, of pain, the pain experience, and how we uh, respond to patients, and we're just gonna carry through from here on. So when we're talking about non-pharmacological therapy, that means we're looking at uh, beyond medication, how are we responding to pain? Uh, and really our goal here is to reduce the, uh, both the frequency of uh, uh, analgesic administration and the dosage when we are giving uh, analgesic administration. And that's not because we don't believe in it or because we don't support patients to be pain-free, but that's because we know that there are very significant side effects associated with um, uh, pharmacological intervention for pain. Um, it's also important to recognize um, that these, uh, that nociceptive input or that descending pain uh, mechanisms are really critical in understanding how we can um, uh, interfere with pain perception. So how we can provide um, um, interventions that actually interfere with our body's ability to perceive the pain, and that's really critical. So here are a couple of things. Massage, that's a pretty obvious one. A therapeutic exercise, so it doesn't mean go to the gym or in my 1980s world, do the 20 minute workout, uh, but it actually means you may uh, engage in some exercise that is prescribed and it is appropriate. Uh, it can involve a variety of different mechanisms. Um, uh, remember I told you I, I need my, to have knee surgery and the doctor, I said, should I be getting myself all geared up for it? And the doctor said, no, if you carry on with your Aquafit, that would be all I would um, hope you could do. So it's that idea of the, a, a, an, um, a professional, it could be a physiotherapist, a kinesiologist, a physician, or a nurse practitioner, even a nurse, can work with the client around what is appropriate exercise. Remember I talked about that TENS machine, you know, Dr. Ho uh, thing where you see those muscles contracting, um, is really helpful. The thing about a TENS machine, remember I talked about those, those pain pathways and how we can interrupt them. The TENS machine actually does that. By giving our body a different kind of stimulation, uh, we sort of overload that sensory circuitry and in overloading it, our body is not able to uh, then experience that sensation of pain because it's feeling something else. And here's a good example. How many of you as a child, or even now, let's say you bump your arm, how many of you instinctively, let's say you bang your arm, then rub it? Isn't that sort of an instinctive response? Think about it for a second. Uh, watch, I, every one of you is gonna say no, but think about it. Uh, when my girls hurt themselves, I often say, come here and I'll give you a good rub. Lots of moms give a kiss, which is a little bit of distraction, um, but a good rub because our body can't experience the sensation of pain, let's say from that bump, with that sensation of that skin rubbing at the same time. So it sort of jangles our sensory pathways and that, uh, that sort of a physiological um, uh, distraction. Uh, we can use heat and we can use cold uh, by preference. There's different theories about what's more effective, less effective. In the end, usually now we just say by preference. Um, we also use some cognitive techniques for um, um, pain management. Now we don't do these instead of uh, analgesia, but we often can use them with analgesia. Uh, so if you're lying in a room and there's nothing going on and all you're doing is staring at the wall and you've got some pain because you've just had surgery, you have let very little th to think about except that pain from surgery. But if there's other things going on, if there's an opportunity for you to go to uh, some kind of class or have some social interaction, have some other distracting entertainment happening, um, you know, whether that's a, a guest, a visitor or something like that, it, distraction is really important. Even magazines, books, um, the opportunity to um, get up uh, if you're not necessarily just immediately post up, but get up and go to the patient lounge so there's someone to talk to. Things like that can be so helpful. 
Uh, some kinds of relaxation strategies can be really important uh, using things like uh, meditation, guided meditation, um, mindfulness, things like that, uh, quieting the room and other things. Now, remember, it's important to keep in mind the difference between how we respond to acute pain and how we're going to support you in that and how we would help you with chronic pain. So, for example, in the middle of um, having a, an, an acute episode of, let's say, post-operative surgical pain, it would not be helpful to say to your patient, just try to relax, right? Because what would you say if somebody said to you, just try to relax? But that idea of the calmer you are, the less likely you are to feel uh, tense and the more likely you are to, the pain medication is to be effective and also that you're not to have it augmented by that state. Also that idea of self-management, we talked about PCA pumps. The more you're able to be in control of your own uh, medication administration, the more you feel empowered through that and, you, and in having that control, you're, you're much more likely to use less analgesia than if you were asking for somebody else to deliver it. Uh, complementary and alternative therapies are really big. I think most of us have been involved in trying something like that. A global perspective has really changed that. And if you look at, there's a really interesting upturn in both Pakistan and India right now. Uh, China, with this coronavirus, interestingly, there was a real push on um, a, a traditional Chinese medicine and other things. So. For all of us, I think it's important to have an open mind around complementary and alternative medicine, uh, recognizing that the patient makes choices, but it's really important that we also understand what they may be uh, taking. So when we ask about um, medical history and any medications they take, we also should be asking about any over-the-counter or herbal or complementary medications. So how do we work with patients around um, pain? First, communication, right? We need to be talking with our patients. We need to have a good rapport. Um, it's important that we leave space for patients to really talk about what they're feeling and what their pain is like. And they're not complaining when they're ringing the bell or when they're telling you their pain is unbearable. They're trying to um, gain from you an understanding of what they're experiencing. Our response uh, in the situation like that is to really um, try to express some empathy and really help the client know that we are on their side now, on their side doesn't mean I can always give you what you're hoping for, right? I can't always be the person who uh, ensures that you're pain-free because sometimes that's not possible. I will do my very best, and we will work with a huge range of options, and I will be your advocate. And ensuring that the patient realizes that is really important. So here's a really good example. We've got a couple of patients. Both of them are uh, first post-operative day. They both had bowel resections. They both have uh, morphine um, in a PCA pump. And despite having used the same amounts, one person is comfortable and the other is in severe discomfort. So what do you think uh, there may be in, in terms of barriers to effective pain management? It's really important just to consider that just the data doesn't tell us anything, right? So they both had the same kind of surgery. Uh, they both have the same kind of um, pain uh, regimen, and yet uh, their experience is not the same. There's a whole lot going on there. So just ponder that and, and uh, go through your readings and consider um, the factors that may be barriers to effective pain management in a situation like this. And here's some answers. <laughs> uh, one, uh, we're gonna talk about tolerance and I'll talk about that in one second. Two, we're gonna talk about dependence and we're gonna differentiate that from tolerance. And three, we're gonna talk about addiction, which is something that we talk about. So uh, tolerance. In the, in the situation of tolerance, um, at, it's really important to recognize that drug tolerance is not the same thing as drug addiction. In drug tolerance, we uh, develop, um, our body acclimates to having that medication on board, and so we require a higher dose to get the same effect. Now, we used to think that that was very common and patients would go up and up and up on their pain medications in chronic situations, but truly uh, evidence is showing that it's not as common as we once thought. And what we're doing now, instead of just increasing the dose, uh, is that we actually are changing the pain medication. So we can rotate a little bit through pain medications um, if that tolerance develops, if a pain medication is not effective, it, rather than just increasing the dosage. Because what we want to do is really prevent those situations where patients are on chronic high doses of um, analgesia. The second one we talked about was physical dependence. And when you think about it, at when our bodies, our uh, brains, our nervous system is exposed to a chemical for long periods of time, we acclimate to it. Now that's really uh, an adaptive thing. Um, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, this is kind of a gross example. Um, 
one of my girls was sick last week and she was tooting a lot. She's three, so I can eat, I can say this. And it was very stinky. But after a couple of minutes being in that stinky room, you stop noticing it's so stinky. Is everybody kind of with me? And I'm sorry for those of you who are grossed out. But we acclimate to something, to a sensation. So in that case, it's the, the smell, right? We acclimate to it and it's not as noticeable. Or, I, or maybe I'm just the only one who does that. In any case, the same thing happens with that medication. We become acclimated to it. And because we become acclimated to it, not only may it become less affected, uh, effective, as in the uh, previous situation where we were talking about tolerance, but we can become physically dependent to it. Uh, in which case that when we try to remove it, we'll have withdrawal symptoms. And think about uh, for people who may smoke or um, do other illicit drugs or other kinds of things, the same thing. We become so used to having that chemical in our bloodstream that when we, that chemical is removed, we can end up going through withdrawal. And rather than expose our patients to that very um, uh, difficult situation of medication withdrawal, we would taper that drug. And that's not because, it's because we see um, physical dependence not as a um, moral failing, and that's really important. There's a shift. We don't make a judgment about it. We recognize this is a physiological response to uh, being on pain medication for a period of time, and our goal is to really support that patient to remove uh, the need for that pain medication consistently, and so how we do that is to taper them off. And then finally, um, addiction. And again, we really have moved away from this idea of addiction as, as something that is bad, or that something that a person who is weak or has uh, some kind of character flaw or other things uh, find a situation they find themselves in to really understand instead that it is a primary chronic neurobiological disease, right? So it is an addiction is a disease. It happens within our neurological biological system, the chemical structure of our neurological system. And there's a lot of factors that influence uh, addiction. Genetic factors, are you predisposed to addiction? Psychosocial factors, your social environment, your state of mind, your um, psychological experiences and other things, and environmental factors. It's really important to recognize that when we're talking about addiction, there is impaired control over drug use. So it's not that I wake up in the day and I think, hmm, will I use drugs, will I use drugs? Gee, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. In addiction, there is a, a, um, that compulsion to use those drugs uh, and continued use and often escalating use despite the fact that harm may be occurring uh, and recognition that harm is occurring. Um, and often it's really important to recognize when we're talking about addiction, it's not even that people, you know, people often have this misconception that uh, someone who's using these drugs is just, uh, just wants to be happy all the time or just wants to be buzzed all the time. Most people, who, when they get to a point of drug addiction, as opposed to drug dabbling and other things, really uh, are not experiencing any fun. They are experiencing constant debilitating craving unless they are in the midst of using their drugs. So it's a very difficult situation. Um, and it's really important to recognize that the previous things we talked about, tolerance and dependence, are not indicators of addiction, right? Physiological response, but not indicators of addiction. And we have to separate those out. A couple of ethical issues that we know nurses talk about. One, fear of uh, creating a situation where we're moving the patient much more quickly to death uh, through the uh, use of analgesics than they might otherwise. Should I hold that dose because maybe the patient's respiratory rate is diminished? We don't. Uh, it's, our goal is always a peaceful death, and as long as we have um, clear criteria, we would move forward in that. We would never intentionally allow someone to be in the midst of pain. Um, also, this idea of using placebos for pain treatment or pain assessment, and I shared my own story of that in class that is against uh, code of conduct, uh, against College of Nurses, um, and it is um, fundamentally unethical, and we do not take part in that. Let's talk about some special populations. Um, individuals who have a cognitive impairment uh, often have uh, communication challenges, and it may then impede their ability to explain the kind of pain they're having or to understand um, an ex explanations we may be involved in. Um, and it's important then for us to recognize that rather than someone indicating uh, verbally the type of pain they're having uh, and all of the parameters, we may be watching for behavioral cues or physiological changes, grimacing, grunting, other kinds of things that may tell us a lot more about that pain than a person who is able to easily verbalize. 
And we're going to carry on. Uh, for a person who's got some kind of cognitive impairment, whether that's a developmental disability or whether that may be due to something like a stroke or um, other kinds of um, disabilities that, that you acquire later in life, it's important that we can kind of use those scales. But the one to 10 scale, remember, we've got someone who's experiencing some impairment in communication. That scale from one to 10 is much less effective here. And so we may use uh, scales. Uh, such as those face scales and other things we showed you in class, Lexi showed you those when we were in a large group together. We may look at vocalizations and how they sound in comparison to how a person normally vocalizes, facial expressions, and again it's not that everybody's facial expressions are the same but we come to know them and we may ask caregivers or family members to help us in interpreting that. We look at respiratory rate and their patterns of breathing, uh, we look at body movements or tension, if they're holding themselves tight, if they're um, um, protecting a part of their body, um, and consolability. Are we able to comfort that person and bring them to a, a, a place of rest or comfort? And we're going to carry on just a little bit more um, with cognitively impaired individuals. Uh, it's really important that um, the nurse understand the meaning of behavioral prompts, and that means that I have to involve other caregivers. Right? So I, don't, I can't necessarily interpret whether a grimace means a person is happy or a grimace means a person is unhappy or a grimace is just what a person does reflexively. And so I need to really involve um, other health providers if a person is, has uh, come from an institutional type setting, uh, family members, um, other nursing staff who've been working with that client for the uh, last number of days, and make sure that that's, this is clearly documented. So we all have a pathway to under, understand how to effectively assess and then treat this person. Clients with substance abuse problems are a really important special population. Um, just because a person has a history of addiction does not mean that they do not require adequate, adequate pain management interventions and that they, they, and we must always recognize that they have the right to receive that pain management. Uh, so it's important that we assess and provide relief but when we have a dual diagnosis, and typ typically when we're talking dual diagnosis, we may be talking uh, addiction and um, uh, psychiatric uh, um, diagnosis, addiction and uh, developmental disability diagnosis, uh, and, uh, and or even addiction and um, physiological um, uh, medical diagnosis. That can be very challenging. We bring the whole team in. Um, it's important that we recognize that this is a part of a person's medical history just as any other disease process will be part of a person's medical history and we work with them, not sort of whispering behind closed doors. Um, important that we establish that treatment plan. We want to minimize uh, the amount of use of, of analgesics where possible while also ensuring that we are getting effective pain control we also want to make sure that we minimize the withdrawal symptoms because if we put somebody into an acute withdrawal situation, they are likely to then begin using illicit drugs because it is incredibly difficult to experience. Uh, and always, I, this is uh, usually I would say almost inevitable. You want the entire team on board. You want uh, specialists in addiction and mental health as well as um, other members of the team, uh, the social worker, the nurses, the physician, uh, the, pharma the pharmacist, the entire team comes together to really support an individual in moving forward uh, in this situation. Oh, too soon, we're done, and uh, I will post this right away, and I look forward to seeing you all this week. I hope it's helpful for you.